If there is one thing true about buildings, about anything in the built environment, it is the concept of, quote, frozen music. What we believe gets put into what we build, and conversely, one can extrapolate our beliefs from our buildings. There are no neutral buildings. All of them are signposts and symbols, meaning something or pointing to meaning elsewhere. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our next uh, uh, installment of the beauty class. We are talking about Gothic and Neo-Gothic architecture uh, today. If you're wondering why the bulk, the entirety of this video is filmed in my basement plumber's water heater studio, we do have class uh, at Augustine's in our normal place on Monday, but today's lecture required so many slides and so much video editing and kind of transferability and whatever that, um, I mean, if you're watching now at Augustine's uh, with, with me in the audience, me speaking on the screen and me in the audience, um, that was my whole intention behind this episode, to make the entire episode video edit, all, add in all the photography because it's very, very necessary for today, and then be able to um, watch that together and talk about it um, as a class. I'm going to take you through 102, I believe, slides in some. I just got done reading from uh, the fourth chapter of my book, the Hippo Lectures, entitled Frozen Music. Frozen Music is a great um, guide, a great analytical tool to looking at buildings. What is unfrozen music? Normal music. You just hear, hear the notes. Every uh, structure has frozen music. This is frozen music. It's not moving. It's, it's stuck in place, but the design sings a song to us in some way. So keep in mind frozen music as I take you through the slides. And as we go through the whole thing, I'll be reading a couple times from the Hippo Lectures again, chapter number four, which is all about architecture, to give us some kind of rooting and foundational stuff. I'll come back to it two more times, talking about Notre Dame, and uh, at the end, just kind of the four rules of good uh, church architecture and architecture in general. So welcome, glad you're here, and let's get started. Let's get this done. Uh, 102 slides, absolutely sweet. A Gothic art, architecture and etc. First, not Gothic. Romanesque. Although, do learn this algorithm. Dark chocolate, 95 to 99% cacao, like aqueducts, Romanesque goes into B, higher, lighter, brighter, Gothic, and unto a tail end, which we will not discuss, the C, overwhelming multimedia Baroque. All right, so uh, this class, right? As I, I say, always kind of in my intro, my disclaimers, whatever, uh, at Vandal Catholic, our maple syrup history beauty class for this semester, the focus being on things that are beautiful, the beautiful, like the good and the true, leading to God, who is goodness, truth, and beauty himself. 
This is not a design specific class. I am very blessed, very lucky, very privileged, and very excited that I get to teach classes that are like strictly on design, architectural history, whatever. Um, that's a whole different ball game, right? In this beauty class, we're going to take bits and pieces of different things we've talked about already. You can see following on the channel, different personalities. It's very, very much a mixed bag, cornucopia type approach. So I'm not asking you to um, have to go super, super deep on design. You would take a class specifically on design, even in the all the years that I've been director of intellectual formation at Vandal Catholic, um, going back like nine semesters now, we did a class specifically on architecture and Catholicism. And even that, right, we focused a lot on kind of the underlying philosophical theological points. It wasn't just designed for its own sake. This lecture is not designed for its own sake. It's number 13 of beauty. And it's fo focusing on the Gothic school. So we're not going to do too much with theory. Um, a lot of it's going to be kind of freezy, you know, like, wow, this looks like blank. Does this elevate the spirit? And, and the kind of great question I want to ask you is our next episode is going to be on the country parish. And we're going to be looking at some more, um, in some cases, maybe more modern, but definitely closer to home churches. And when you look at the great Gothic example that we'll have today, which of course is Notre Dame in Paris, how does that compare to the churches we have now? It's the kind of free sea, kind of just obvious, you know, you know it when you see it type of question. Nonetheless, that disclaimer in place Learn this algorithm. So the Gothic school is not Romanesque. The Gothic is, when I say dark chocolate, 95 to 99% cacao. Yeah, it's like baking chocolate. The Romanesque is very no frills, no nonsense. It's like aqueducts. It's like churches built like aqueducts. It's called the Romanesque because at that time, Charlemagne, the year 800 AD, crowned Holy Roman Emperor. He's like, well, this is Christendom coming into being, but we're just going to copy everything Rome did basically to the T including our architecture. So the Romanesque school, which which go, comes before the Gothic school, is not Gothic, obviously. Something that comes before something cannot be that be that thing. Romanesque, if you remember, it's dark chocolate, plain coffee, no additives, buildings like aqueducts, good. Our transition into Gothic is higher, lighter, and brighter. The churches that we're going to look at today become higher, more verticality. They became they become lighter, Thanks above all, if you want a really architectural nerd kind of point, thanks to flying buttresses. Flying buttresses are that which allow walls, which in the dark chocolate era had to be very, very thick in order not to fall down, to become lighter, lighter loads being born and, and not, uh, not risking collapse and brighter. Gothic is really defined by illumination, the rose window natural light. What's not on this board is Vitruvius, the father of architecture, had three rules. Every good building must be structurally stable. It must be livable. And then, oh, wow, beautiful. How appropriate for our class. Stability, livability, and beauty. And we're, of course, going to focus on that third one. But that transition into higher, lighter, brighter, it can be lighter while not violating the first Vitruvian rule of stability because of flying buttresses. But as you move from aqueducts into Gothic, which is our focus today, you tail end that Gothic school, just kind of FYI, with the overwhelming multimedia Baroque. A lot of it is tied to ideas in the Counter-Reformation, trying to push back against the Protestant Reformation. Um, that's neither here nor there. Again, we're not going to get into that. We're going to focus on the Gothic. But just an FYI, keep this uh, in mind. Okay. But, right, let's look at what Romanesque is. A lot of free C and kind of comparative stuff helps if we know, well, it's enough for you to just say it's not this thing. What is that thing? Romanesque, sturdy stone foundation, stick stone walls. That's the 95% cacao, dark chocolate, straight up coffee, like aqueducts. The use of arches and pillars, barrel vaults, darkness and coldness complement sturdiness once more. And it's like Rome. It's very much churches like aqueducts for the hundredth time, but, but it's a new Rome coming in being, kind of a Christendom. All right, here's some quick example. Charlemagne's Palace at Aachen. Okay. You see, of this whole map here, the only exigent, still existing thing is the chapel on the, the bottom right, the thermal spas, the sources of warm water, the, the throne room, um, and all that have kind of disintegrated over time over the last 1,400 years. The chapel is still standing. You see a picture here in modern Germany. This is Romanesque. This is still pre-Gothic. This has some, it seems almost like at first glance, ah, that's, there's a, 
I almost see the evolutionary step wanting to happen. It's not gothic yet, but this is really not gothic. This is cryptic. It's like a crypt. It's dark. It's cold. It's dark chocolate, right? It's like a tomb almost. It's like an aqueduct. And as we move into early Romanesque, also not gothic, St. Martin's at Canajou, uh, this classic Romanesque uh, design style, use of the arch, heavy use of the stone, fine balance, enclosing, and, and uh, you know, interior darkness with exterior illumination. Um, St. Martin at Canajou is once more a not gothic, before gothic, Romanesque, very no-nonsense, aqueduct-like establishment. What a gorgeous monastery. What a beautiful, you know, sacred space. That's not gothic. That's very, very much no frills. Once more, still um, looking like, if you especially look at the arcade, the, the arches, looks very much like the, you know, you can pop down and just even Google Pont du Gard, P O N T D G A R D, Pont du Gard. It's the most famous kind of exit surviving Roman aqueduct in modern day France, Gaul. As the Romans called it then, and it looks kind of like in the basis of here, right? Remember, serious arches, sturdy. You, re you really see the earlier point I had about the exterior, interior space, illumination, that kind of thing. But inside, once more, where this monk is praying, this is very, very dark chocolate, serious, no frills, not, not HLB, not higher, lighter, brighter. No, you know, it is still very much the old stuff. Now, second not Gothic, nor Neo-Gothic, classical slash neoclassical or Greco-Roman or Greek Revival style is not the Gothic school. People, how many times smarter than me? A million? A billion? I don't know. Like how, how, how much smarter is Aquinas than me? No, an infinity? You know, whatever it is. People like Aquinas and the great uh, theologians and philosophers would talk about often defining something by what it is not in a negative sense, right? And so again, so Gothic is not Romanesque. Gothic is not the Baroque we're not even going to talk about that comes after that is massively full, multimedia in your face embellishment. It's still not that. It's not the Greco-Roman style either. And a good example here is the Basilica of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Baltimore. Main facade, Greek style, Ionic column, portico, Dome at the back of the church. Benjamin Latrobe, the guy, the dude who designs the U.S. Capitol, and he's our Vitruvius. Benjamin Latrobe is the American Vitruvius. Remember, Vitruvius, again, this is not a design class. This is not at all, right? We're focusing just on aesthetic beauty. But on that point, remember Vitruvius's three rules. Stability, livability, and beauty, aesthetic beauty. Um, Latrobe is our Vitruvius. He's our main kind of architectural genius mind. And some people say this is even more than the capital, his kind of masterpiece. This is in the Greco revival, Greco Roman style. You see the kind of the, the entrance to the church itself is classic Greek temple architecture, especially those beautiful thick columns. Um, this is not Gothic. Okay. And the interior space, too. There is some lightness here, there's verticality. Uh, this is not Gothic. Finally, guys, I'm not even going to show you pictures of this. You can go look at it yourself. But third, not Gothic, the super electric technology and progress plus Beaux Arts American Renaissance. So we, the Gothic school is not Romanesque. It's not Baroque. It's not Greco Revival. Um, it is not Beaux Arts American Renaissance. This is my favorite school of architecture, perhaps. I don't know. A lot of you that know me too know that I am, in a lot of ways, very. Uh, very um in favor of modern kind of architecture i like that especially the bauhaus school i have a real soft spot soft spot in my heart for, for bauhaus the corbusier new internationalism maya spandero all these kind of modern architects I, I like them i just do you know sorry awesome fist bump or too bad however you feel about modern modern architecture i will confess to kind of liking it and modern architecture is so much opposed to uh what we're going to look at today you know, Gothic. Remember, you can also jog back in the Maple Syrup History playlist. Look at the Sagrada Familia with Gaudi. That was episode three of the beauty class. That Gaudi built the Sagrada Familia in the Gothic style plus environmentalism, right? Gothic plus a return to like the forest, nature, the way God designed things in nature. The Gothic school, which I'm going to define pretty soon, once more for like a negative definition of what it's not. Yeah, modernism 
is flat roofs, no verticality, no iconography, monochromatic, sheer facades, glass, steel, and it's not gothic. And Beaux-Arts American Renaissance is not gothic either. If you want to look at Beaux-Arts American Renaissance, pause this video, go look at 1893 Chicago World's Fair, or 1898 Omaha ex Exhibition, or 1904 Exhibition in St. Louis. You can see all these beautiful architectural pieces that are very often Greco-Roman and almost Byzantine in, the, in their dome and use of porticos and columns, but tied to technology. Groshen, give me an example. Of, uh, okay, no problem. At 1904 in St. Louis, you have Byzantine gold domes and columns, and in the background of, of, of a very famous photo, these guys have like a, a, an oil rig looking wireless telegraph transmitter um, because they're all about tech. Because we are all children of the 1880s. I say to every class that I ever teach ever, the people of this time, think about Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone, all the different inventions would understand our telecommunications much better than we think they would. Someone born in 1880 would today be 144 years old. And you think, yeah, right, dude, you know, wow, that guy, he has no clue. He's like basically from ancient times. Not at all. Someone born in 1880 grew up in an age of technological fascination. That same hypothetical person would have been 13 years old at Chicago and 24 at St. Louis would have been playing with all these gadgets and all this kind of stuff. The Gothic is not about tech. It's not about gadgetry. So we talked about what the Gothic is not, right? Well, what is Gothic though? What is Gothic architecture? You know, when are you going to tell us what Gothic architecture actually is? Well, here we go. Ample use of large expanse of glass, stone structural construction, blah, blah, blah. You can read the rest for yourself. That's what I love about videos, right? You can just pause me now and take a note on this for like 50 hours if you want. But A through E are the kind of like defining features, ribbed vaults, clustered columns. Think about either red vine or Twizzler, kind of whatever the candy is your preference, you know better, the kind of red candy that's twizzled together and you kind of pull individual strands off. Those strands are like columns together. They're clustered, obviously, pointed spires. Uh, very famous spire on top of Notre Dame. Excuse me, is Notre Dame a Gothic uh, example? Notre Dame is the Gothic example, right? Notre Dame in Paris is the Gothic church in the whole world, period. Don't let anyone tell you differently. It is the Gothic church. And there was a very famous spire on top of that, and it got, you know, burned. It got burned in the fire of April 15th, 2019. Ribbon vaults, cluster columns, pointed spires. We talked already about E, the flying buttresses, the slanting whale rib like looking things that make hlb possible allow us to move away from the aqueduct and the dark chocolate and the plain coffee 30 foot walls to fulfill vitruvius's first rule of stability and create rose windows beautiful just amazing but please note yeah the gothic is a very very kind of like catholic school of of architectural design a lot of the sculptures have religious icon iconographical significance religious iconography um, statues of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Sacred Heart of Jesus, saints, even the gargoyles at Notre Dame have religious significance. So we'll talk about that um, in a second. This is what Gothic architecture is, right? We talk about what it's not, this is what it is. So early Gothic example, um, Notre Dame. And one thing to note of its special importance, uh, an evolution from the Romanesque, because we talked about already, Rose windows, this great example of this later push of the Rayonant Gothic style. And uh, you see the kind of information. It takes 182 years to build. Maybe it takes a long time to build things with excellent quality. See how long it is, longer than a football field from goalpost to goalpost. And that lost spire was you know, 300 feet tall. Please keep in mind, this is the only time I'll go back in the slides. Everything I show you for the rest of this lecture, of this episode, of this maple syrup number 278, I believe, episode 13 of Beauty, Keep this in mind right here. Keep this A through E in mind. Keep it very close to your um, understanding. Use it as a guide. Pause me right now and write down ribbed vaults, clustered columns, spires, sculptures, buttresses. Like Keep that in mind, right? And, and A through E, please write this. A through E under an umbrella labeled HLB, higher, lighter, brighter, and then maybe another umbrella, Vitruvius number three, beauty. Yes, the Gothic school is supposed to stand be structurally stable, yeah, it's supposed to be um, livable. You're supposed to feel livability it doesn't just mean actually living in a space, but like feeling at ease, moving around the space well. For someone at Notre Dame, livability would mean like 
it's a pleasant place to attend mass, you know, that, that kind of thing, right? That would fulfill livability for, for Notre Dame. But beauty is what we're all about in this class. So uh, take a couple moments to write that down, and then we'll get to uh, looking at Notre Dame. First example I present to you is arguably the most famous Notre Dame in Paris. More than 400 feet long and half a football field wide, with 10 bells, two towers, and a now destroyed spire 300 feet tall, Notre Dame was built over the course of two centuries, with the ground breaking in 1163 to the final completion in 1345. This because people used to understand that some things, in order to be done properly, have to be done with meticulous attention to detail, without rushing, without the breakneck haste that defines our society today. Notre Dame in Paris was built over 200 years not just because of technological limitations or the fighting of the Crusades or any other wrench in the mix. It took that long primarily because people cared. They actually believed the faith they professed and would rather die trying to make God's house perfect than live to see the slightest imperfection. Would that we had some of that latter attitude today. Today it's about getting it done as fast as possible, period. In the sacred and secular spheres alike, nothing seems to matter more than the bottom line. The quickest turnarounds onto the next project, the cheapest materials, the most unjust wages, who cares? And so the built environment around us today, its frozen music so aggressively discordant and off-key, proclaims those philosophical principles precisely. You people are nothing but mammon-worshipping, talent-squandering, pseudo-religious imbeciles. The joke's on you, by the way. And future generations will surely condemn you thanks to us, the quote, monuments you'll leave to posterity. But it wasn't always this way. This can be easily deduced from the western facade of Notre Dame, its circular window within a square outer border, verifiably living the maxim that a picture is worth a thousand words. Here is beautiful frozen music 101. The square symbolizing limited created space, the world now holding the transcendent circle representing infinity, representing God. In one glance, just one piece of this architectural marvel, one comes to know exactly what the space is about. Christ's incarnation, the infinite word made flesh come to dwell within space and time, the circle within the square, entering the square so as to redeem it, elevate it, perfect it, perfecting us in this fallen world. And that rose window circular in its infinite reach rose for a reason. For the rose is the symbol of Notre Dame herself, the Blessed Mother, whose long ago fiat, the angel Gabriel, made it possible for the circle to dwell within the square. For the infinite God to so love the world that he could send his only begotten Son into the square, into the very heart of our time-bound temporal quotidian Valley of Tears. Right behind the striking symbol is the circle and the square theme raised to loftiest heights. God himself truly present in the Holy Eucharist. The circle and square on the facade an invitation to step inside this time-bound sacred space to feed on the bread of angels, the very infinite God's infinite gift of his body, blood, soul, and divinity, just waiting for us poor sinners to repent, to turn to him, and begin to eat and drink our salvation. Now that's good architecture. That's but 1% of a beautiful cathedral called the Liber Paporum the poor people's book. And the whole reason, uh, this idea of liber paparum, is that illiteracy obviously is very, very high in the Middle Ages, but if I am a Catholic, a practicing Catholic, who attends Mass, who keeps the church calendar, the fact that I can't read is not a limitation to my faith. I can still hear the sermon, the homily at Mass on Sundays, and most specifically, I can go to cathedrals like that one right down the road if I were so lucky to live there, uh, Notre Dame, and read all my faith written in, uh, in stone. Now to looking at the actual photos. What I'm going to try to do uh, when I take you through the photos of all these examples is kind of just shut up. I'm going to try to shut up and let you look at the things. You do the A through E kind of in your own mind. The HLB, the Vitruvius Beauty. Do you see why it's beautiful, etc.? That very close to us, that the thing's jutting off, those are the flying buttresses. 
number one architectural thing to revolutionize this whole deal, higher, higher lighter, brighter. I mentioned earlier, even the gargoyles have a point at Notre Dame. And they obviously are, right? This being a Catholic church, kind of Catholic frozen music, that the battle between heaven and hell is ongoing on earth. Even in this most sacred space, reception of the Eucharist, mass, you'll come to confession here. I'm just everything a church symbolizes. A person could be a rock ribbed atheist, completely secular. And still understand, oh, a church that's supposed to be about, about God, about holiness. There's these images of the devil, so to speak, of sin, of temptation, of vices. So even the grotesques are meant to remind you, hey, that's why you're going through that church, to, to, to seek sanctity. For the universal call to holiness, to be good, because bad guys are everywhere. In this valley of tears, as that prayer to the Blessed Mother goes, that beautiful prayer, um, Hail Holy Queen. In this valley of tears, this exile that battle rages on. So even the gargoyles have a point. They're not just like, oh, cool. That guy looks like he looks creepy and he's like, a, he's, a, he's like a horror movie character. They have a kind of theological significance. Deacon Dennis Thomas, his brother, Father Paul Thomas, talked about sacred music. Higher, lighter, brighter helps sacred music, helps that the organ notes float and bass the roof. Music's important, right? Uh, in the church space, certainly. So from one example, period, the Gothic example, Notre Dame, to Chartres Cathedral. Cathedral de Notre Dame de Chartres is the, you know, cool kind of, everything's better in French, you know. Sorry, not sorry whatsoever. I always say like, the greatest, the, the greatest um, sadness in American history, I think, is that the French defeated the British in the French-Indian War, which was the North American counterpart um, to the, the Seven Years' War going on in, in on the European continent. The French-Indian slash Seven Years' War takes place between 1756 and 63, uh, a decade before the American Revolution. If the French would have won, all of us would be speaking French as our main language. We could still have everything the same, guys. The bald eagle, American freedom, NFL, light beer, NASCAR, American uh, enthusiasm, positivity, America's the best. But we'd just be saying it in French. It'd be so, so much cooler, so much cooler. Um, grander organs, more well-lit space. Marian pilgrimage site increases its visibility popularity. It's 430 feet tall. You see the very, very impressive um, space. No, once more, Chartres Cathedral is not as impressive as Notre Dame in terms of international claim and fame and that kind of thing. But hey, I mean, 200 statues, 176 stained glass window. Remember, higher, lighter, brighter. I mean, it's got all these features. And Notre Dame de Chartres is a just a really, really beautiful, beautiful church. I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you're, you're following this beauty class. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your support of Maple Syrup History. Vandal Catholic intellect. Uh, if you've been following for a while, I mean, it's kind of just, it is what it is, right? Either you understand why it's beautiful or you don't. I don't know what to tell you. If you watch a guy throwing a bullpen in baseball and he throws 105 miles an hour, either you understand that's crazy impressive or you don't. Uh, your friend Joe can speak 17 languages. Either you're like, that guy's the man or I don't get it at all. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. There's, there's nothing I can do here. I think it's just obvious. This is obviously crazy, insane, beautiful. Crazy insane. Or the Gothic school is this kind of like direct beauty shot. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty good kind of like just for evangelical purposes too, for the purpose of evangelization, the colligation, the unity in those transcendental principles of the good, the true, and the beautiful kind of working off one another. And either you see that or you don't. I don't know what to say, right? I mean, like, if you're like, I don't get it, then I, I can't say, I can't help you.
Um, you see how it's juxtaposed against or set against a kind of more modern city, obviously, even getting out towards like what looks to be kind of a classic countryside and that kind of thing. And yeah, the grand cathedrals of the world are not in space, right? Gaudi's Sagrada Familia is in Barcelona. It's in downtown. So, you know, what is the surrounding architecture like as well? You don't have to care about that at all. Remember, this is not an architecture class, not a design class. We're just simply talking about one feature of an architectural thing, Gothic architecture as a handmaiden of beauty, the good, the true, and the beautiful. You don't have to worry about all the other kind of stuff, but I mean, just like, again, the free visuals sometimes are most instructive. I feel like here at this picture, like, yeah, it's a cliche, but it's true. You know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah, I, you can just kind of just like sit with this photo, right? I mean, you can just see so much here. The geometrical proportionality, the depth, the length, the verticality, the beautiful, beautiful vaulting, the arcades, the columns holding up the, the arches, the arches in between the columns, columns upbreaking into the arches, the scarcity, the minimalism, right, in the interior structure, and the natural light, the rose window. Uh, again, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to say. You can sit here kind of in almost like contemplation, looking at this photo, and, and wow. And that's kind of the whole part of the beauty class. I'm not being sarcastic when I talk about, like, why did I cover Bo Jackson? Why did I, why am I going to talk about Catholic actors and actresses? Why do we talk about Hemingway's writings and read like 40 of his quotes? Because if you're like, oh, it's a Catholic center, you know, Maple Syrup History is a Catholic production. And it is, it's true. Well, so I get why you talk about saints and stuff. Duh, right? Oh, fine. But like Bo Jackson, really? Yeah, Bo Jackson throwing a ball 360 feet on a line, probably with 115 mile an hour muzzle velocity out of his arm is beautiful. It's striking. I believe, I argue, all kind of examples of raw beauty point to beauty itself, beauty himself, God. God ultimately alone is good, true, and beautiful. So there's something here too, but I don't know. It's just like a signpost. Signpost something otherworldly. Siena Cathedral in Italy noticed the Renaissance accentuation, especially in the ceiling. Western style, Romanesque, aqueduct, Gothic, Rayonant Gothic, Baroque at the end, but in between the Baroque, kind of mixed in between, you have, you know, the Renaissance, of course, happens in Italy. And it's not just people like da Vinci and Michelangelo and, and sculpture and Piazza della Signorina in, in, in Florence and, and Dante's Divine Comedy. It's also in the design built environment of cathedrals. Very Gothic facade. That's very Renaissance like because, guys, nothing happens in a vacuum, things evolve onto one another. They spill over the page and they connect. There, there's, there's connectivity here. Siena Cathedral is very much a Gothic production, but it's got very, very heavy Renaissance embellishments. Super, super involved and even overabundant use of color. And you can see here, right? almost a candy cane-like striping. Uh, very, very beautiful. Again, you know, you can be mad, like you're being a broken record. Fine, I apologize, but I don't know what to say. Like, here it is. Okay, here you go. Here's our, like, that's how I feel when I hear like Mozart's music, watch Bo Jackson play baseball and football and read Hemingway. But I think this is like so obvious, like architecture to men and women all over the world. I think one of its defining characteristics, whatever the genre in the school is, is beauty. Um, Yeah. Of course, you can't violate Vitruvius's first rule. Of course, the building can't fall down. That is the number one thing. And of course, it has to be livable. Who wants to be in a space they don't like being inside? But I think beauty is the kind of game changer, the ceiling ingredient, the main thing. By ceiling, I don't mean S-E-I-L-I-N-G. I mean S-E-A-L-I-N-G. Ceiling like closes the deal. It's the, it's the most important thing. Very, very heavily Renaissance influenced um, as well. Saint Chapelle in Paris. Another kind of check it out, you know, example. Wow. 
Why do I have this slide again? Exact same slide. What gives, dude? Why do you have the same exact slide? Because this lecture is titled, this maple syrup history episode is titled, you know, Gothic and Neo-Gothic. Neo-Gothic is just Gothic. Neo, of course, means new. And talk about the staying power of a school. The Neo-Gothic craze in America is like 19th century, 1800s. Those people are like, let's build our churches and our spaces exactly like they did in, in Paris 600 years ago, 500 years ago. It's the exact same thing. Um, they'll use local materials and new technologies available to them. But I have this repasted without even putting Neil on there because Neil Gothic, the only thing different about it is the temporal reality, is the time that takes place later on. It's the exact same idea. And our best example of the Neo, this is the this is the Notre Dame of the Neo Gothic school. I mean, you see the photos, you probably have seen the photos before. You will understand why. And wait a second, you'd be like, wait, Groshin, uh, I love your entry. I love your opening to maple syrup history. It's so cool. I love how you have the maple syrup bottle. And when maple syrup comes up, kind of like flashing lights, there's a sound of like traffic. It's very sweet. It reminds me of like bustling five hour rush hour in New York City. And then you have the, the little light switch that shows the episode and then you start. But before all that, you have this lead in where you play a bunch of stuff and you might be like, that's, that was that, right? And you'd be exactly correct. In the opening to this episode, and you may pause the video now and go back to the beginning if you, if you want a refresher, I show you footage I took on my own phone of this past Christmas break of St. Patrick's Cathedral. It is our Notre Dame. It is the most famous neo-Gothic structure, arguably in the world. It's just like Notre Dame. It's, uh, I, I promised I wouldn't go back in slides, so I won't. It's all those same principles, just 1879, not 12th century. 400 feet in length, prime material is local materials, Tuckahoe marble clad in, in brick, largest neo-Gothic uh, cathedral in North America, can seat as many as 3,000 people, very much in the prime real estate of um, middle Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, you know, right there in, with very close to Central Park, a little bit above 30 Rock, Madison Square Garden, all that. Um, two pipe organs in the interior make up the entirety of the Gothic 13th century master, uh, 13th century Renaissance. Yeah, it's 100% it's like imitation is the sincerest form of flattery thing. And of course, with the large Irish population in New York, it's an ethnic shout out to the grand uh, Irish saint, you know, very, very famous American. St. Patrick's Day is very, very famous in America as well. But you probably double back and say, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg because of all the Irish immigrants. I mean, like, there, this is it, right? This is Notre Dame. It's just Notre Dame in New York City. It's our Notre Dame. Pipe organ, rose window, clustered columns, verticality, higher, lighter, brighter. Yeah, I, I got it. Same deal. Yeah. Notre Dame Basilica in Montreal. Some people say, hence my first bullet point, no, no, not, not St. Patrick's. This is the most Notre Dame, the most Gothic-like outside of the one in Paris. 259 feet in length, dominant building material stone. Jog your memories back like 10, 15 minutes ago. The Gothic evolves out of the Romanesque and keeping the first rule of stability. Stone is a great foundational building material for stability, for, obviously. Pipe organs more of a trivial answer, you know, first be operated by electricity for the purposes of the sacred music of the mass and all that. It's the same idea of just having the music flow up, bass to the whole space. Three statues, Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Joseph, St. Jean Baptiste, 11 million yearly visitors, 1 million short of Notre Dame in Paris. What's most shocking about this structure, that's great, okay, you know, beautiful, iconography and statues is that that's not like a filter that's actually what it looks like notre dame montreal is like wow like luminescence to the max it almost out illuminate out illuminates itself out of the the gothic school altogether it's almost has in my in, by my lights kind of a baroque insistence over insistence on sensory sensory indulgence over indulgence i mean it's so crazy colorful right and that 
is that beautiful or do you find it too striking or I don't know, but that that's real. These are real, like they're not photos that are somehow filtered or colored in or edited in any way. It's what it really looks like. Wow. I mean, that's, you know, that interior lighting is quite, quite impressive. And I use the word impressive in the actual etym etym etymological um, correctness of like impressive mean like my jaw drops. I could be impressed and bad. I don't like it. it's too intense. I'm impressed. Please give me the the coolness of St. Patrick's, the kind of subdued, demure nature. Or I can be impressed like it's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's the most beautiful. It's impressive either way. It's shocking either way, right? How about move to the south? Do they do neo gothic stuff in the south? Dang right. St. Mary's Basilica, Natchez, Mississippi. Open in 1882. Takes 40 years to complete because war stops everything. Duh. All of you know when the Civil War was. All of you, I bet I can ask all of you, you know, put a hundred bucks on the table, name the dates of the Civil War. And every one of you would claim that hundred dollars. It's 1861 to 65. I knew that. That stops construction, whatever. Okay, that's just a great factor with building sites and whatever the kind of projects might be. War is always a disruptive factor. Duh, once more. Primary building materials, brick, two stories tall. Central Tower has a spire extending up. Spire is Gothic 101. It's our third at C, right? Of the Gothic things I told you, A to E to keep in mind. Above a classic Gothic recess entrance on a window laid in proportional facade. It's minor basilica status at the close of the last century. The Gothic theme is everywhere. Striking painted ceilings behind the high altar and tabernacle, plentiful iconography, and use of the classic column arch and cruciform blueprint layout. All right. So what does this look like? What does the St. Patrick's of the South look like? The Notre Dame in Montreal or Paris of the South. Where Gothic is a very conspicuous, present all over the world type school. Very, very popular in America. Right away, you might notice um, it's more humble. It's obviously it's not the size of Notre Dame or either one in Montreal or Paris or St. Patrick's. And inside, I mean, I think crazy beautiful. Not as impressive as St. It's not St. Patrick's. Nat Does anyone need to be told Natchez, Mississippi is not New York City? I don't, I don't think so. But this is a beautiful photo uh, in the lack of pixelation. It's very clear, very well taken. It shows that it's a grand, grand, beautiful space. I actually was lucky to, to be here. Um, I spent five years in the South, as I think all of you know. I got my PhD. I got my master's degree and PhD both in history, both from Mississippi State University in Starkville, Mississippi. If anyone doesn't know where Starkville is, it's kind of north central, northeastern part of the state. It's actually very, very close to the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Starkville and Tuscaloosa, Alabama and MSU are, are the two closest SEC schools. Um, it's like 80 miles, you know, a little over an hour, hour and 10 minutes to travel between them both. Natchez is not by Starkville. It's like three or four hours southwest. Natchez is actually more in the, the New Orleans orbit, western delta part of the state, Mississippi River, Vicksburg, headed down towards Louisiana. Very beautiful church, beautiful city, beautiful church. And again, Natchez is kind of out of the way, right? It's not like people have been to the south. They've been to Atlanta, Nashville, right? New Orleans, not off to Natchez. It's kind of final photo I have for you. What does this look like? Ah, you know, you might be saying it's very Sistine Chapel like. Well, once more then, Sistine Chapel, Renaissance, there's some overlap in the school. There's some overlap, some borrowing, some sampling, that kind of thing. All right, my friends. So, um, yeah, thank you for your engagement as always. Thank you for keeping up with the episodes and all that. I love, love, love. Uh, doing this. I, I love it. I love it more than I can say, honestly. It's so fun. It's so fun getting, however humble and in all glory to God, however humble my contribution of what knowledge I have to you is, however limited and all that, it's still very, very fun to give you that. It's fun if you can take advantage of these things. It's especially fun to see you in class. Um, you're always welcome in the classes, Monday and Wednesday, 1 30 to 3 o'clock, the Ambrose Room at the Vandal Catholic Center, St. Augustine, the second floor. And go get your Monica's coffee first, right, on the on the entry level, our coffee shop. For upcoming stuff, whatever it is, et cetera, um, go check the website, mandocatholic.com, and look at the syllabus and all that. And, and uh, don't be a stranger. Having watched all that, having taken all that in, I want to return to uh, the close of the Frozen Music Hippo Lectures chapter 
and read that conclusion and uh, talk about well, where do we go from here in terms of good church architecture. Today's lecture was on the Gothic school, but it's on church architecture in general, right? And so reading from the text, the close of the chapter, the close, yeah, the, the last two paragraphs close the chapter, as to where we go from here, the answer comes from combining the wisdom of two books I assigned my University of Idaho Augustine's, and Catholic, architecture class this spring. And that spring was uh, in 2020, a couple years now, a couple years ago now. Michael Rose's Ugliest Sin and James Howard Kunstler's The Geography of Nowhere. Rose claims all good church architecture has three features, permanence, verticality, and iconography. While to mind the most important takeaway from the Kunstler's, from Kunstler's book, just substitute somewhere for nowhere in the title. Kunstler argues that one of the most depressing features of the contemporary built environment and landscape is that in every place looking like any other place, strip malls, fast food joints, outlet stores, any real sense of place and meaning has been lost. So, instead of geography of nowhere churches that look like they were purchased from a pre-made kit at Home Depot, how about we take seriously the timeless geography of somewhere approach, putting in the time and requisite effort to create something unique and thought out, something original and teeming with a sense of place and rootedness, if we want good frozen music, well-built Catholic churches today, no need to return to the 13th century or whine about today's art and architecture scene. Distasteful though it might be, just follow or at least begin with these four principles. Make sure to make to build permanent structures under the philosophy of geography of somewhere that will stand the test of time, quality structures whose verticality directs one, one's mind heart and worship up to where it belongs, to the heavens, to God. And like that famous western facade at Notre Dame or the Vietstas altarpiece at Kostru Mariatsky in Krakow, Poland, eschew the whitewashed and blank walls of a blank faith for, number four, vivid iconography that can still today, for the literate and illiterate alike, be a true liber paporum once more.